I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning to our Coffee with the Curator. Um, as you all know, this is a program that we do on the first, uh, first Wednesday of every month, uh, focusing on either our exhibition or something Dolly related. Uh, we want to thank Cafe Gala for sponsoring this and providing the coffee for re our refreshment. And um, thank you all for coming. It's a very large showing and very appropriately so. This is going to be a great talk this morning. We are very, very pleased to be joined by Ignacio uh, Chiita, the son of uh, uh, Eduardo Chiita and our director, Hank Hine, and our curator, William Jeffett, who've been working tirelessly on this exhibition for quite a while, uh, will share their insights into the show, we'll have a conversation, and afterwards there'll be an opportunity for all of us to uh, ask questions. So with that, thank you all, and thank you for joining us. So William, I wonder if you would uh begin by introducing the show and perhaps a bit of your relationship with Ignacio and give a sense of the number of years that this project has been maturing. Okay, um, can everybody hear? Uh, we've been uh, working on this for several years. Um, uh, it, it, it's, a, it, it's a project that had a lot of uh, happy coincidences uh, along the way. Um, uh, it turned out that both uh, Hank and I had known uh, Cheetah when he was alive. I met him on two occasions, once in an opening in, in Madrid. Uh, there was a dinner after the opening, and we were seated at the same table. And, uh, and then another time in the early 90s, there was a conference in Barcelona that uh, I participated in, and so did Eduardo Cheetah. Um, and, we, and I met him at that time. I didn't, know, I didn't know him very well, but I knew his work very well. Uh, also, when I lived in England, uh, I saw various exhibitions of his work, including the, the huge and very important exhibition the Hayward Gallery uh, did in 1990 and, uh, and other exhibitions that took place in, in London. And uh, he was one of the sort of, you know, major figures of um, post-war uh, European art um, and merged around the same time as the, the great painter Anthony Tapius, another major figure of post-war art. Um, so um, the uh, Ignacio and his family, uh, after uh, uh, Eduardo died, set up, uh, or actually it was a project that Eduardo was working on before he died, that is a kind of foundation with uh, a lot of outdoor sculptures um, that's located near um, San Sebastian in the north of Spain. Well, I'll show you in the map in a, in a few minutes. Um, and uh, in, a, in a place called Hernani. And, um, and it, it's very much about looking at sculpture in a natural uh, environment. And I went there to have a look at it. Um, and um, uh, suggested to Hank, why don't we think about doing a cheetah exhibition? And, and Hank said, well, you know, I, I also, I, I knew cheetah and we, we had been working on a, on a book project together uh, that we never finished, um, but that had been, you know, very advanced and oh, that would be a great idea. So we started, a, you know, a very long uh, series of conversations with Ignacio we, we both went to the, out to visit the, the foundation and to discuss the, uh, the possibility of an exhibition and, and also the idea of, uh, of, 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 of completing this artist's book uh, that had never been uh, published. The, the, the proofs had been done. And Hank, in a few minutes, can tell us more about that story, which is very, very interesting. And so we began a, a series of conversations and dialogues and you know, eventually made a, a kind of selection. Um, and um, you know, over time, some, some modifications took place and the result is the, the exhibition you, you will, will see. We worked very closely with Ignacio and the foundation uh, also on the, on the production of a, of a beautiful catalog which uh, will be available. This is a, an example of it. Um, and it was a really interesting partnership. So the book was designed and printed in Spain, uh, and we produced content. The foundation produced content, and um, and uh, the catalogs the the result of the project. So the the exhibition has two or three different aspects to it, um, and 
one of our main intentions was to provide uh, uh, an overview of the, of the artist's work. And he was not just a sculptor working in one material, he worked in many different materials, in alabaster, in iron, um, and uh, in um, ceramic, and also uh, artist books, collage, drawing. Um, so a, a wide range of materials that, 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 that have something in common across them. Um, and uh, our intention was to, to give a, a nice broad presentation of the, of this, uh, of, of the full range of the artist's work uh, on an interior scale. Uh, he also does public sculpture, and, and they can be quite enormous. And we decided that we wanted to do a you know, and, uh, the more intimate side of Cheetah's work rather than the big uh, public side. But there is that as well. And we'll show a couple of images to give you um, an idea about that. Okay. So. Well, we, uh, I just want you to uh, uh, welcome Ignacio Cheetah. He's come a long way and has uh, delivered this exhibition together with the uh, ardor and, and dedication of, of William Jeffett. Um, so if we can say bienvenidos, Ignacio. So the other point that's important to make um, before we start is that we, we want to have a little dialogue with Ignacio, um, but uh, his English is a little bit limited, so I will be helping <laughs> and aiding and possibly translating or interpreting as best I, as best I can. Um, uh, but what we were thinking of doing is to show a, a number of slides to give a little bit of background and also to, to give you a little sample of what you will see in the, in the exhibition. Excellent. So this is a photo of of Eduardo Chida, <laughs> give you an idea of the, the human dimension. Um, and um, of course, like Dali, Chida is a Spanish artist. Um, and uh, of course, Dali came from Catalonia, and um, Chida comes from the Basque country, which, like Catalonia, has its own language and its own rich uh, traditions. Uh, one of which has to do with the uh, rise of, of metallurgy and in industry uh, and working with metal, which I think is an important reference uh, for, for um, Cheetah. Cheetah's the next generation after, after Dali. Let's see. Uh, I want to just move to the next image. And this is to give you an idea of the foundation um, Chida Leku, which means Chida place in Basque. Um, and there's this old uh, farmhouse that Chida very carefully restored for showing in interior works, but most of it is a, a kind of piece of property with, that's outdoor for the presentation of sculpture of varying formats. Um, it's extremely beautiful. And uh, um, Ignacio, can you say a little bit about the 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 process and evolution of the of Chida Leku as a project? Uh, uh, I am really sorry about that. <laughs> My English is very good. You better translate, William. Um, Chida Leku nació en el año. 83. They started um, this project in 1983. So they, they had a, a friend who was uh, the council, the Spanish council in, in, in Bordeaux in France porque estaban haciendo una exposición de obra de pequeño tamaño en la casa de Goya. So, because Chida was preparing an exhibition of small format works in the house of, of Goya, which is in France. 
que pertenecía al gobierno español. Which belongs to the Spanish government. Y allí conoció al cónsul de España que se llamaba Churruca, Santiago Churruca. There they knew the, the Spanish council in, in France called Santiago Churruca. Y bueno, pues al conocerse, este señor le invitó a ir un día a ver una casa que tenía cerca de San Sebastián. This man proposed to Chida to show a house that was very close to San Sebastian, uh, near where... In Hernani, que está a 10 kilómetros de San Sebastián. Hernani is 10 kilómetros outside of San Sebastian. Entonces, porque era un hombre muy educado, pues dijo que muy bien, que cuando quisiera que le irían a visitar. So this very polite man said that any time they wanted, they could come and visit this property. So, when Chida went to see this beautiful property, he went also with his wife, uh, Pilar, um, and he wanted to make the point that his parents were not like two separate people, but were like absolutely like one person, unified in uh, many, many aspects of the, the work. Y ese mismo día, paseando por, por esos terrenos que, que veis aquí y tal, se fijaron principalmente en ese edificio que es la antigua granja donde pues, había gente del campo trabajando, etc. So they, they fixated on this house that's on the property, which was the old kind of farmhouse, uh, but, but more um, uh, farmhouse not in terms of uh, where people live, but farmhouse where the animals live. Uh, it was in a kind of semi-ruinous state. Había otra parte de los terrenos, porque estos señores tenían una gran cantidad de, de hectáreas de terreno, pero a ellos realmente lo que les interesó mucho más que la casa de esos señores, que era una casa pues muy bonita, pero sin más una casa del siglo pasado y tal, lo que les gustó mucho fue este edificio que es del año 1592. Uh, this house is from uh, uh, 1592. Uh, there's another house that's more modern that, that's on the property, but they weren't very interested in that. They were interested in, in, in this in particular. It's also a large piece of property that's in the, the landscape is very beautiful. Es uno de los caseríos más importantes que hay en el País Vasco y desgraciadamente esta familia, Churruca, no habían hecho nada por, por mantenerlo. Estaba prácticamente cayéndose, o sea, estaba abandonado. It's, one of the, it's an important house uh, uh, for its age, uh, but the demand that owned the property uh, had not been taken care of and it was more or less falling apart. Uh, Entonces ellos, mis padres, les preguntaron que por qué no hacían nada, porque habían decidido que se cayera el caserío, ¿no? Y, y le ofrecieron ya entonces, ese mismo día, la posibilidad de comprarles el edificio. So they asked the man about whether they could buy the, 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 the building. Uh, y lo hicieron. Compraron el edificio en pocos días y un trocito muy pequeño de terreno alrededor para poder llegar con los vehículos, camiones, etc. y poder restaurarlo. So they bought the house and some of the property around it and, uh, and uh, uh, a kind of access to the property uh, with the idea of being able to put sculpture there. Eh, esa restauración llevó 17 años. So they've been restoring this house for the last 17 years. Pero mi padre, en todo lo que hacía, ponía todo su esfuerzo, no solo económico, evidentemente, sino también de todo lo que a él le interesaba. Lo mismo que si estuviera haciendo una escultura. Exactamente igual hizo con el 
con el edificio. De hecho, el edificio no solo es el nacimiento de todo lo que luego es Chigidalecu, sino que es el alma de Chigidalecu realmente. So he put as much uh, emphasis and energy into the house as he would in his own work as a sculptor, and the heart and soul of the Chidaleco is the house. Uh, it's the biggest sculpture in Chidaleco is the house. <laughs> Eh, la cuestión es que poco a poco primero compraron el caserío y ese poquito terreno para poder llegar y al cabo de un tiempo pues fueron comprando más terreno durante seis distintas ocasiones hasta alcanzar la, el tamaño que tiene ahora que son unas 11 hectáreas. So they, uh, it's not completely a joke that the house is the main work um, and so they started with that little access uh, piece of land to the house, but over the years, in six occasions, they bought more and more of the land around it with, to arrive at 11 hectares, which is the size that it is now, and explicar, of the property around the house. Hay que explicar que Chigidaleku nació de una manera muy espontánea, muy naturalmente, no era algo que tenían ellos pensado hacer un museo. It was spontaneous, they, it just happened. They weren't sitting there thinking they're going to make a foundation or a museum. It, it was because of this experience that the project uh, evolved. Coincidieron varias cosas para que eso hubiera sido una realidad. La primera es lo que hemos hablado de conocer al señor consul de España. Y la segunda es que en ese mismo momento que visitaron y compraron el museo, murió en Memag que era el director de la galería Mike de París, famosísima, y que mi padre eh, pues, trabajó con ellos durante 40 años, lo menos. Y Mike murió justo en el año 82, casi casi al mismo tiempo que conocieron. So, uh, the same time that, he, that this happened by chance, he, the gallery he had been working with for many, many years, uh, Mike, um, the director of the gallery, uh, the original director of the gallery, Aimee Mike, died, that was around 1982, uh, and that was a big transition. todos tuvieron que elegir en ese momento si se quedaban con la familia Maek o se iban con los directores de Maek que iban a crear otra galería. O sea, tenían que tomar una decisión. Y mi padre no quería tomar esa decisión porque tanto unos como los otros eran amigos. Y decidió que ni uno ni otro, que él se iba de la galería. So this was an important transition for him because when this, when uh, Amy Mike died, uh, uh, there was a kind of schism in the family because he left, uh, he wanted to leave his, the gallery to his business partners, that was uh, Le Long and Jacques Tupin. Uh, and there was a split between that side of the gallery and the descendants of, the, of Aimee Mike, his son. Um, so it kind of split into two galleries. So all the artists, all the, which included uh, uh, Miro and and uh, Palazuelo and Tapias and, and many others, uh, important artists, uh, many of, some of whom were Spanish, but others, uh, Giacometti and so on. They had to decide uh, which side of the family, which side to choose, whether it would to go with uh, the Mike family or to go with uh, the new gallery that was gonna break out of it. And Chida decided, uh, Eduardo Chida decided that he, he, would, uh, he, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't choose, he didn't want to choose, because many of these people were all friends. And um, he didn't want to choose one or the other, uh, so he decided to leave completely, both, both sides. <laughs> Eso tuvo, tuvo una consecuencia, y es que él trabajaba en exclusiva para Mike, y todas las obras que hacía, 
excepto las que él quería quedarse a su colección privada, eran de Mae. En el momento que ya no estaba en Mae, él iba acumulando obras. Y no solo iba acumulando obras, sino que las obras que hacía eh, necesitan este material que utiliza, es un material muy especial que se llama acero forjén. So, um, he had been working exclusively with Might for a very long time, since practically the late 1940s and, and first solo show, early 50s in the gallery. I think there were seven or eight solo shows over the years. And of, of course, a lot of the work uh, stayed with Might, and some pieces Cheetah kept for himself. But the minute that he left the gallery, uh, nothing was going to Mike anymore. It was all uh, staying with the artist. Um, and he was working with Corten Steel, uh, for example, uh, which was a, a new type of steel that was invented in the um, mid-1960s. Uh, and it has lots of qualities that artists like. And that piece we're looking at there is, is is an example of what we're talking about. So he had, all of a sudden, uh, wasn't sending them to the gallery, but, but had a problem of uh, what to do with all of his sculpture. Había dos problemas fundamentales. Uno era que cada vez tenía más esculturas, porque luego sí que las iba vendiendo a museos, colecciones, pero aparte el acero corte necesita cinco o seis meses estar al aire libre desde que sale de la forja hasta que toma una pátina que le autoprotege. So the, uh, one, pasa mucho tiempo. One problem that he, of course, he carried on selling pieces to museums and to uh, in, in lending pieces to exhibitions and so on, or making public sculpture. But one problem he encountered was that this material core tin, even if you were to sell it. Um, before you, you do that, the, the piece has to sit uh, outdoors for a period of time for several months to, because it develops a special kind of surface patina which protects the metal during that phase and you have to kind of let it uh, cure, <laughs> as it were, before it goes off to wherever its longer term thing is so it needs, uh, it needs a place. Entonces, esas ambas cosas lo que hicieron es que tuvieran necesidad de ir comprando más terreno para poder colocar las esculturas y que fueran cogiendo su, su patina, etc. So he had to keep buying more sort of pieces of land in this property <laughs> as he kept accumulating sculptures in order to leave them uh, to a cure outside. <laughs> Con eso lo que quiero explicar es primero que su intención no era realmente hacer un museo. Poco a poco las cosas fueron llevando a que eso se convirtiera en un museo. Y cuando él cayó enfermo, ya en el año 99 o por ahí, que empezó a tener síntomas de Alzheimer, eh, pues entonces nosotros, que llevábamos trabajando mucho, eh, yo he trabajado toda mi vida con Chillida, le conocí a Han que en el año 92 o 93, porque vino a mi taller a San Sebastián, so um, the original intention wasn't to make a museum. It just kind of happened slowly over the years. Um, and uh, in till 1998, when um, uh, Eduardo started to have um, problems of Alzheimer's, he died in 2003, I think. Um, and uh, Ignacio worked very closely with his father because he printed uh, most of the artist's prints, so he's, he's a master printer, and he knew Hank in 1992 and 93 when Hank went to visit uh, the studio and to discuss the idea of making an artist's book. Y bueno, pues entonces eso, las cosas llevaron a donde llevaron, y en esos tres años hasta que murió mi padre, pues aceleramos todo para poder abrir el museo al público. So que abrimos en el año 2000. 
So Dos in, años antes de que so uh, once Eduardo started to be ill, they they began to develop more rapidly the idea of a museum, and it opened uh, in two, in the year two thousand, uh, uh, two or three years before Eduardo died. So it was it, it opened uh, as a project and as an institution uh, prior to his death. Y bueno, la historia posterior, pues fue estuvimos abiertos al público diez años al público general y pasaron un millón y pico de personas en esos 10 años y fue realmente un, un éxito, no sabíamos qué iba a pasar, pero fue un éxito muy importante, era uno de los museos más visitados de, del País Vasco después del Guggenheim de Bilbao que nació más o menos en el mismo momento en el comienzo del año 2000 so pero we... desgraciadamente en el año 2010 lo tuvimos que cerrar. So in the so they opened in 2000 for 10 years and they had a, a little bit more than a million visitors in that period which is, was very high for the Basque country. The, the only other museum that had very substantial attendance was the Guggenheim which opened around the same time as the Cheetah Foundation. So they were open to the public as a sort of private foundation but in 2010 um, they decided to to close uh, access to the to the general public because uh, of, of uh, financial difficulties. E intentamos llegar a un acuerdo con las instituciones del País Vasco y España y no fue posible y bueno pues tuvimos que tomar esa medida pero el museo es visitable como siempre se mantiene perfectamente y lo único que hay es llamar por teléfono y, y se le da a la gente una, una cita para tal fecha. De hecho, vienen muchísimos visitantes, pues más de 10, 11 mil personas vienen sin, sin más porque llaman. So, so they uh, decided to, to close to the public uh, and they sought some solutions with the regional government that didn't really work. So now they, they carry on the foundation only by appointment um, and they have around 11,000 visitors a year but all, all, all phone ahead of time um, rather than uh, it being open uh, like, a, like a, 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 a museum institution or whatever. So it's um, the, the gardens and everything remains the same and there's, there's quite a lot of interest in it. But, um, for these pragmatic reasons, uh, it, it, they have to operate like this right now. So if, if, if anyone's interested and wants to go there, all you have to do is phone and uh, <laughs> make an appointment and, uh, and you can visit it. It, it. it is extremely beautiful. gente realmente que a veces nos quedamos muy impresionados porque vienen gente de, yo qué sé, de Alaska, de, de sitios muy, muy lejanos de Estados Unidos, muchísimos también. De hecho, la mayoría de la gente que va al Guggenheim, no la mayoría, pero muchísimos, van al Guggenheim y luego van a Chigalecu, o al revés, van a Chigalecu y luego van al Guggenheim de Bilbao. So the people that are visiting are from all over the world, and many, many of the ones that go to the Guggenheim Bilbao want to come to Chita Leku because it's, it's only uh, 10 kilometers away, and, uh, and uh, there was a lot of connection between the Guggenheim and Chita also, it must be said. Shall we, shall we uh, just to mention that the exhibition will also travel to the Meadows Museum in Dallas. Uh, it'll be there starting in February next year. It's nice to have a... Uh, another another museum to show the exhibition and um, in Cheetah had did have some connections in uh, in Texas and uh, he did a big public sculpture um, uh, in front of the IMP designed building uh, that's the orchestra there the Meyerson um, and uh, that was one of his last important public sculptures and he also has an important piece in front of the Houston Museum and and so on uh, so so it's a, it's a nice partner. It's a museum that has a significant collection of Spanish, uh, Spanish art. That's a Calatrava sculpture in front of it, um, an artist, uh, architect from, uh, from Valencia. Um, I'll say a little bit about um, 
who is Eduardo Chida. Here you can see his birth dates, born in 1924. Beautiful photo of him with one of his uh, earlier, uh, earlier pieces, uh, iron work. Um, this is to give you an idea um, where we're talking about. Um, so San Sebastian is just, you know, just a very, very close to the French border. Um, so you know, you're only like 15 kilometers away from uh, Biarritz or so uh, in San Juan de Luz. Um, so it's, you know, Figueres is on the other side, on the Mediterranean side, and so we're on the Atlantic there. It's also, uh, here's um, uh, Cheetah's parents. Uh, now, this is a little anecdote, but it's a significant anecdote. When he was young, Cheetah was a very important football player on the, on the San Sebastian Football Club, which was an important football club. Um, and um, so he was, a kind of, he was well known as a football player. He was goalkeeper. Um, and then he had a, a, a knee injury and, and gave up, um, gave up uh, playing football um, professionally. Um, his training was as an architect. Uh, and this is also uh, interesting in terms of his approach to sort of volume and, um, and things like that. So he had, he had that, that training and he sort of went very far into his architectural uh, training before he decided to, to work as a sculptor rather than an architect. Um, just, um, we mentioned Mike and the gallery and this, this is a, a, just to give you an idea. Um, and as, as we said before, they worked with so many, many artists, uh, also with Brock and Kandinsky. So when, you know, when Cheetah first made contact with the gallery, uh, he met all these people, Calder, um, Miro, uh, and became close friends with many of them. Um, it's also important to say that the gallery met in 1947, uh, did an important exhibition of international surrealism. Um, so it was one of the later international surrealist exhibitions, but so there was a strong connection between the gallery and uh, and and surrealism because of that. A few um, sort of um, historical references to situate Cheetah within 20th century art, uh, going back to the prior generation. Um, when Picasso started to work with uh, metal and welded metal. Um, he uh, did pieces like this around the period uh, uh, 1929, 1930. Uh, some of these projects were related to the idea of doing a monument for the poet Apollinaire. Uh, but um, uh, Picasso uh, learned to weld uh, through a partnership with Julio Gonzalez, um, who's, another, uh, who's an artist from Catalonia. Um, he taught Picasso how to weld and helped him to make sculptures like the one we just saw. And he also made an important body of work, uh, especially in the, in the 1930s, we, we, with uh, out of forged uh, iron uh, using welding. Um, and other artists of the pre-war period that are important um, for Cheetah could be people like Henry Moore, who tended to work with uh, stone or with bronze. Uh, Giacometti, uh, who modeled and then cast in bronze. So th they're all working with slightly different uh, media. But I mean, an important thing about Giacometti is the sort of um, uh, tension between the, the density of the material and the, uh, and the sort of figuration. And, and we'll see that there's a kind of, um, uh, while in many ways Cheetah's work looks at, at a glance, uh, abstract, it has a kind of connection to the figurative and to the human body. Uh, and in a way, that's something he shares with an artist like Giacometti or Miro, uh, I already mentioned, and this is a sculpture by Miro, um, and uh, whose work is very, uh, very figurative as well. Um, the uh, American artist David Smith uh, became very important in the post-war years in the United States, and he's, he's somebody who owes a lot to Julio Gonzalez as well, and kind of took a lot of ideas of, of, of um, Julio Gonzalez, especially this idea of drawing in space, 
um, which was a, an important idea that, um, you know, as with Henry Moore, that it's not just the form, it's also the voids, the relation of the positive and negative that's important in, uh, in, uh, in sculpture. That, so this, this was a completely kind of new idea from the traditional idea of the statue. Or Brancusi, who's wonderful interest in materials and working with stone and, um, and, and carefully polished metals, and, and, and he would use these beautiful bases as kind of components within the, within the sculptural form, which, is, again, it's a, there's a kind of figuration and it's very reductive, um, a real key figure of the earlier uh, generation of avant-garde sculptors. Um, Chiquida, cuando fue a París en el año 48, eh, no fue precisamente a conocer otros artistas ni cosas parecidas. El primero fue para conocerse a sí mismo. Y por otro lado, tenía un gran interés en conocer el, el Louvre, el Museo del Louvre. ¿Por qué? Pues porque él tenía un interés enorme en la escultura griega del periodo arcaico eh, las Islas Cícladas, etc. Y todas sus primeras obras de esos años que estuvo en París, de 48 a 52, tenían una relación muy directa con el arte griego. So, um, when he went to Paris in, in the late 40s, he didn't go because he wanted to meet all these artists that he later came to know. Uh, uh, he wanted to go and discover who he was as a person, um, and also uh, his going to the Louvre and knowing the collection there was very, very significant for him. And there he saw a Cycladic sculpture and Greek sculpture, and that was, was very, uh, very important. Uh, <coughs> y no hizo ningún esfuerzo por no conocer a ningún otro artista excepto a Brancusi, precisamente a Brancusi, que él era el que más le interesaba de todos los que por allí estaban. Tuvo la suerte de entrar en MAC y a través de MAC conoció a Alexander Calder, que fue uno de sus mejores amigos, junto con Joan Miró, que también fue uno de sus mejores amigos, pero también a todos los demás que estaban en so he, uh, um, when he first went to Paris, he was most interested to know Brancusi, uh, and he had the, he was lucky enough to enter into the gallery Mech very young, and through there he met all those other artists, and in particular Calder and Miro were very very close to him, and became very close friends. And the others were were other artists in the gallery, but the, some of whom he became very friendly with over the years. But he didn't go to Paris because he had a list of artists he wanted to meet. <laughs> Um, and uh, he also thought that Picasso, uh, for, for at least for Cheetah, that Picasso's sculpture was enormously important, even though that Picasso is most known as a painter, that that kind of sculpture, like the one we were looking at, was a huge contribution on the part of Picasso. Did, did uh, he know Picasso uh, directly also? Una pregunta. ¿Conocido Picasso directamente o...? o? Muy poco. No, una vez intentó ir a verlo cuando vivía en, en Francia, en la Provenza, uh -huh. con otros artistas españoles para convencerle de que ayudara a una causa importante relacionada con la política, etc. Y no les quiso ni recibir. Pues, he, he didn't really meet Picasso. He tried to meet him uh, 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 because of one thing to do with the solidarity of Spanish artists to do with politics. But it was later on when and he wasn't able to uh, to meet Picasso because of that. Um, we can look at some of the some of the early work. Uh, here you can see a drawing. Uh, wait. I've already done this. Am I going in the wrong direction? Okay, here we go. Um, so 
uh, we mentioned the Greek sculpture and um, and some of the early works were quite figurative, both in sculpture and in drawing. And um, Cheetah's drawing is very kind of linear. I'll give you another another nude, and then um, it's important, and you'll see in the exhibit a uh, number of these hand drawings. But throughout his career, he did these hand drawings, and he did over over decades. Um, and they're extremely uh, beautiful, and I think they help uh, uh, understand. Um, many aspects of, of his later uh, formal evolution as a sculptor um, that you can you can see many metaphors in the way the sculpture uh, the, the forms work that there are shapes that are like fingers of a hand or like the torso of a body or the branches of a tree there, there's this connection with nature and with uh, organic and or human bodily form that's that's very significant even though uh, the very early sculptures, like this uh, sculpture that refers to the female body, is something that he left behind fairly, ra fairly rapidly. But for example, the hand drawings is not something he left behind and, and c continued to be important throughout his career. Um, so these are some of these very early pieces to give you an idea. So that you know that, that could be maybe related to Brancusi and even to ARP and artists like that. Um, now I mentioned that he did a lot of public a lot of larger scale public pieces and I'll, I'll just give you a little sampling of that. Um, that one was in Germany. This one is in San Sebastian, which is really a, a remarkable piece. Um, the Wind Comb, 1977. Um, here's the detail of it. And it's it's very very dramatic. Um, the, and the, of course, the view of the sea. This is at the at the point where the opening of the bay that's in front of uh, San Sebastian at the very very end of the bay, um, opening onto the onto the sea. Um, this is in uh, Vitoria. The um, it's a it's a, 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 a complete plaza um, built out of stone, and also it has some sculptural elements positioned within it. It's um, monument to the Basque Rite. So historically, the Basque country had a had special kind of um, uh, rights in terms of its privileges in relation to the Kingdom of Spain. And uh, this monument celebrates that uh, long history of uh, Basque identity. This goes back to the 15th century, the, the, the Basque Rites. Here you can see one of the sculptural elements inside of it. So it's like a a plaza that you can go down into. It's very labyrinth-like, and it's right there in the middle of Vitoria, which is the capital of the Basque country. Um, this is a, a, a hanging piece, so an interesting idea is the sense of weightlessness in Chida. Again, you can see how the, the shapes of it, though it seems abstract, are like the articulations of the fingers of a hand. And so this piece is suspended, sort of denying its weight because it's made out of concrete. Another view, really quite amazing, uh, amazing uh, aspect of his work. Um, and then this is um, this is the um, a piece that was done in eight, in 1980, uh, finished in around 86. Um, uh, well, it took a couple of years, didn't it? It was 86 to 88, more or less, the thinking around the piece. And this is in. Um, in Guernica, which is, uh, this is related to Guernica, is important to the history of the idea of the rights of the Basque people, because in Guernica is the famous tree of the Basque people around which they asserted their rights uh, going back to the 15th century. Um, and this monument was done at the, uh, in, in homage to the 50th anniversary of the Spanish Civil War and in reference also to the bombing of the city of Guernica, which was in April. Um, 1937, so we just passed now, last week, the 80th anniversary. And of course, that's the reference that Picasso makes in his famous painting, Guernica, to the same, um, to the same event. So, um, and, and, and this is, uh, the idea is the House of Our Fathers, um, which is uh, referring to a, uh, partially to a, a poem by a Basque poet, Oresti. Uh, and the, it's the idea of, of, of constructing a kind of space um, that, that asserts the sort of continuity from generation to generation of, 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 a, of a sense of identity and culture. 
Um, so it's a, a quite an extraordinary thing. And we have a very, a, a very small iron piece that's related to this idea that was a, a first kind of uh, concept that, that's formally different, but has this idea of openness and enclosure. Uh, here's the interior of it. And this is a, a, another great piece in, in Gijón, in Asturias, in, in front of the sea. There's also this great sense of the sublime, the sort of uh, the sense that the, the form is connected to the world of nature and to the intangible sense of the air, the sea, the light. Um, another view of it. Um, and then um, I won't dwell on this at great length. One of the latest projects that he worked on was, uh, was to translate some of these sculptural ideas into a major kind of intervention within a mountain in the Canary Islands in Tindaya. And this was, a, was, was never completely achieved, but apparently the project is still carrying on. And it's, it's sort of more like what we would call in English earthworks, where the idea was to, to open a kind of space within the mountain and light would be coming into it. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's, it was a hugely ambitious project. It's sort of, you could do a whole exhibition and people have done around this project. So um, it's, it's not really referred to much in the exhibit, but it's an interesting project that he spent years on towards the end of his life and that in the Canary Islands they're seeking to, uh, to achieve, but it's still a work in progress. So, so um, <coughs> maybe, uh, yeah, this is the idea. So you're inside, it's almost like you're inside a sculpture in a way rather than the other way around. Uh, so uh, in that way it is a little bit like some of, uh, some of the American artists from the 1970s that were interested in using light as sculptural form. Um, so, uh, I, I, do you, could you say uh, uh, a little bit about, about Guernica and about some of the public projects? Uh, sí. Eh, lo que hay que decir es que él eh, tenía un enorme interés por la obra pública. De hecho, cuando dejó Mae, como os he explicado antes, eh, se dedicó a partir del peine del viento que habéis visto de San Sebastián con el mar y tres piezas, a partir de allí aunque realmente la primera obra pública que hizo fue precisamente aquí, en, está en Houston, en, en el Museo de Fine Arts, y, y es en el año 60 y pico o algo así. De hecho, en Estados Unidos eh, fue reconocido en, a principios de los 60, había y hay obra en muchos museos de Estados Unidos, aquí fue muy conocido en esos momentos eh, pero él a partir de los años 70 lo que quería hacer era obra pública le interesaba muchísimo por muchas cuestiones él estudió arquitectura y tenía una gran relación de hecho es eh, profesor en, y académico en miles de escuelas de no miles no, es una exageración <risa> pero, pero en muchas escuelas y universidades de todo el mundo es eh, arquitecto honorario, etcétera, incluso aquí también en Estados Unidos. Y le interesaba mucho la obra pública por dos razones, esa es una y la otra es porque él decía que no conocía nada mejor que la obra pública en cuanto que eh, cuando tú haces una escultura pequeña y se la compra a alguien, pues se acabó la historia, casi. Pero si tú haces una obra pública, eh, pertenece a todo el mundo. Y que es mucho mejor, en vez de hacer copias de esculturas y muchas esculturas, hacer una sola, pero que sea de todos. Well, uh, when he broke with Mecht, uh, or left Mecht, because of that story we talked about earlier, he, he, he became very, very interested in public sculpture, and that was important for him. He had done the piece in San Sebastian in 1977, the one with the three elements I showed. Um, and uh, uh, it's true he had had, his first public piece was uh, in the gardens of the Houston Museum of Fine Arts in 1966 or thereabouts. And he had had a kind of 
important career in the United States, but he thought uh, at this moment in the early, you know, the beginning of the 80s, more or less, or the end of the 70s, that that it was important to do uh, public sculptures so that uh, more people could be aware of the work. If you did a small piece and you sold it, then it sort of disappears from its public visibility, and he wanted to uh, create a situation where there was something more permanent. And he didn't want to make lots of multiple reproductions of sculpture. In fact, he didn't. I, 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 I will add this. I mean, he, he, every piece is a single piece. There are no, he doesn't make, multi, like, like you can do with bronze, you can make five of each one. He doesn't work like that. These, the, the iron ones are made directly in iron. The stone is made in stone. And, um, and so he thought this was an interesting way to connect to, uh, to the general public and to, to, to make a kind of contribution. He said a phrase that resumes all this, and he said that what is one of one is almost no one. The one who has one hour is almost no one. He said, well, it, something like if it's, uh, if there's, it was more or less this idea that it, if, if it's a piece that's, that, that goes to one person, it kind of disappears and becomes of no person because it becomes sort of hidden from the world. And he wanted to make pieces in this later period of his work that were in the world, uh, more or less. Um, let's see. Uh, well, maybe we can show you a few ideas of what's in the exhibit. Um, this is a very beautiful photograph. Of and, and William, while you're doing that, can yep. you tell us a bit about the title, which is uh, something you've uh, imparted to it, Memory, Mind, Matter. Sure. And, and tell us why it's not uh, punctuated, how they're each uh, stand alone there. Well, I think maybe, I think maybe elsewhere they, they might be uh, punctuated, but... Um, um, uh, that might just be the PowerPoint, <laughs> but the... Um, well, the, actually, wh where they are punctuated, they're periods, and I think that's part of your concept. Yeah, um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think the, the general idea is that um, uh, sculpture tends to be, you know, in general, people think of it, it's a kind of very physical thing. It's like kind of occupies a volume and so on. And so people tend to think of it in those terms just as a kind of material object. And I think what's really unusual and interesting about Cheetah is that uh, he's engaged with a whole range of, uh, of different um, elements in his approach to sculpture and in, in his work as an artist. So, you know, with the, for example, the, the drawings that we, of the hands that uh, you'll see um, suggest a, a kind of um, sense of memory and uh, a, a sense of a connection to the, the past or, as we were saying, the, with one of those public pieces, the reference to the idea of the, of the history of the Basque country. Um, not, that's not the only idea he has, but it, it, it's, um, there's a kind of sense of the past and memory uh, being recovered through the process of making a sculpture. He asserts the material nature of all the different materials he uses, but he doesn't just leave it there as inert materials. He sort of seeks to find a kind of voice inside the material. So perhaps alabaster suggests something different than iron and he chooses the materials because of the different registers he wants to communicate. And he finds within the, the material uh, some quality that allows him to express uh, thoughts, memories, uh, or poetic ideas, or references to nature that I mentioned. Of course, if you work with stone, which is something directly from nature, it, that's a kind of direct connection. And, uh, and so we thought these three ideas of the of the, of the mental, the physicality of the matter, and also the idea of memory. Um, and there's a book in the exhibition called Memory and the Hand, which is a, a book by the French poet Jabez, and which is based on the hand drawings. There are four artist books in the exhibition. Um, are, are all significant. Also, he had, uh, apart from his connection to many poets, uh, including uh, the, another book in the exhibition is, is, is 
Spanish poet Jorge Guillén, who was one of the poets of the generation of 1927, and who had been at the Residencia de Estudiantes at the time Lorca was there, and uh, around the time when Dali was there. I don't, don't know to what degree they knew each other. But there's a kind of direct connection to that earlier generation of poets, um, as well as others that were more contemporary to Chida. And in addition to this, friendships with, uh, with uh, philosophers, uh, especially Gaston Bachelard, the French philosopher, and the German philosopher Heidegger, both of whom wrote texts about Chida, which are very, very interesting. Um, that's more or less the, the, Thank you. the general Thank you. idea. Um, and this idea of the hands, this is beautifully expressed in this photo where he's got his hands clasped and there's a, a sculpture of clasped hands. Um, uh, of course, the hands are the tool and instrument of the artist in making uh, sculpture. And here's some other ones. Um, and it's very interesting, this kind of coming back to the hand over and over again. I, I think it's worth one thing that we haven't, we haven't sort of uh, overemphasized it, I'm afraid, uh, but it's an interesting little anecdote that um, when Cheetah began to work uh, with drawing, he was, uh, because of his, uh, partially because of his training as an architect, he was a very adept draftsman. But he was scared of facility. He was scared of doing something that was too easy to do, so he set himself a very difficult task which was to teach himself to draw with his left hand. Um, and so, and then here are some of the sculptures that are in the exhibition. Here you can see this idea of this sort of tree torso and the idea of this sort of you know, gripping fingers, in a way, expressed in iron. And this is a later, later one of these pieces in the... Uh, hmm? or, or trees, yes. Or trees, like trees, with the idea of being you know, connected to the, to the earth. I mentioned the, um, this is Jorge uh, Chida on the left with Jorge Guillén. Uh, Guillén had come, come into exile in the United States, and they knew each other when Chida spent time at Harvard as an honorary professor. And he was teaching, I think, somewhere like, maybe it was Mount Holyoke, I can't remember, uh, that he was uh, living in, on the East Coast for uh, many, many years, Jorge Guillén. And this is the book with the poem by Guillén, um, Masaya, which means beyond. Um, this is in the exhibition. Um, the, um, the poem was uh, written around 1936 in a volume of poetry called Cantico, um, Guillen. Uh, yeah, in, uh, and uh, there, there are lines in the poem which are really significant for Chida. There's, there's one line. Um, Profundo uh, es el aire. How deep uh, is the air in this, contra this poetic contradiction of, of the depth and the, and the heights? Um, and that, that's, that's the sort of contradiction you get in Cheetah between the density of the material and the lightness of its visuality or, the, or these other metaphors that we've been talking about. To give you an idea of uh, their 16 plates, it's a very, very beautiful book. And then um, mentioned uh, Heidegger, who's here on the left, um, and who wrote this text about Cheetah, and they met um, in the late 60s, and the, 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 the essay that Cheetah wrote about sculpture was published in 69. And Bachelor wrote about Cheetah earlier on, that during the, those years in the um, late 50s and early 60s, when Cheetah was working with Mecht. Uh, and, then, and it was uh, the essay by Gaston Bachelor was published by Mecht. Um, another book that's in the exhibition is Aeschylus' uh, Tragedy, The Persians, uh, in a German, it was published by a German edition. Um, um, and then this is The Shadow Belongs to Light, uh, with the text by the American architect Louis Kahn, which is the project that Hank worked on with uh, Cheetah, which we're finally uh, publishing. Uh, uh, now in two, 2017, and, and I think we need to ask Hank uh, to comment briefly on, on how it was you came to, to initiate that project. With, uh, okay, well, there, there are two stories here. One is how I came to initiate the project, and the other is how Ignacio had the fidelity to the project to complete it. Um, um, Ignacio and I were both trained as printers, and um, we've become managers 
Um, he manages the Chiida Leku uh, Foundation, but he's still a printer, much to his credit. Um, I had always admired Chiida's work, so I was delighted when uh, William had the idea of doing a show on Chiida and mentioned the several really poignant connections between Chiida and Dali and why it was appropriate to do that exhibition here. And of course, uh, you know, in the uh, foment of the post-World War I period where there was such distrust of institutions, everyone hearkened back to what you can count on. Um, first, the body. And the Surrealists made uh, the body uh, and a disconnected body really one of their topics. So there's that real connection uh, to Eduardo Chiida's work and the Surrealist interest in, in the body. Um, also, it's, it was particularly interesting that you know, there is in Spain this deep uh, transcendental philosophic tradition, you know, the severity of, of uh, the Counter-Reformation art, uh, that sense of trying not to be truant in this world, but to go beyond and to uh, reach the paradisal destiny, the, the, the human destiny. Um, that pervades the Iberian Peninsula, but there are extreme nuances of that. Now, the Basque country is one nuance, and Catalonia has a, a very definite different nuance. So it's a really interesting um, way of looking at their similarity as Spaniards, but also their distinction. And you know the Basque people, I think you have to know, uh, are, are the most ancient people in Europe. Uh, the entire European continent uh, was covered by uh, Celtic people, uh, but the Basque were already there. And then the rest of Spain, which is a combination of Phoenicians, uh, the Catalans coming through, uh, then to North Africa, Carthage, and to the coast of Spain, uh, and the Visigoths coming down and bypassing the, the hardy Basque people who stayed entrenched in their mountains there. So they're very, very ancient. Their language uh, is absolutely impossible for, uh, for all of us and, and very beautiful. But um, so uh, Eduardo Chida, uh, I think, ex you know, to an extreme extent among uh, artists in the Basque country has this great connection to metaphysics. And uh, that's why he chose that poem, uh, Masaya, the beyond, I think, to, to partner with. Well, I had admired Chiyida's work for a long time. And as a publisher, I thought it would be terrific to uh, have a combination of, of uh, Chiyida's work, I was thinking of etching, with the writing of a, of a philosopher or a philosophic writer of some sort. Um, and I'm not sure how I learned uh, that your father uh, liked uh, the architecture of Louis Kahn, but I had come across a, a, a wonderful obscure book that Kahn had written, and in it was a passage that said, the shadow belongs to light. And he had written it in English, so the thing stayed in English, and I assembled some more of, of, uh, of, uh, of Kahn's writing that was about light and about substance and about man and metaphysics and put it together. And um, I was generously received by Eduardo and his entire family. And uh, Ignacio and I had a kinship as, as printers right from the start. And uh, Eduardo said, yes, let's do it. And Ignacio said, let's do this book. Well, for various reasons, the book didn't happen. <laughs> And uh, uh, when uh, Eduardo Chiida passed away in 2002, I thought, oh, lost opportunity. Uh, but William uh, came back and said, uh, Ignacio told me about a project that you started with his father. And in fact, uh, his father had gone ahead and made uh, one example of how the book might be. And uh, so working with Ignacio, uh, we pieced together uh, a, 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 a kind of a revised design. Uh, 
And, and then he produced the book. That is, he arranged for the paper to be handmade, uh, for the type to be set. Uh, uh, I laid out the type, uh, as you do now today, on a computer, choosing a, a kind of eccentric font called Charlemagne. Um, uh, did everything in caps so that it would be as, as pure and, and formal as his father's etchings. Um, now, I just want to explain very briefly that uh, uh, Livre d'Artiste, this idea of the artist book, is, is different from this magnificent catalog. I mean, this is as, as, as nice as you can make a book today. Can you see how beautifully graded the grays are? It's, it's a duotone printing. And contemporary mechanical printing is wonderful. But uh, this is made of a paper that has a sizing on it. And uh, you know, in 200 years, it'll be dust. Um, but there's another tradition of books. And, and that is using handmade paper from uh, pure cotton rag or from uh, cotton and linen. Uh, inks that are uh, hand ground with varnishes made from minerals and, um, and then uh, hand bound together. Uh, so that was the kind of book that we were proposing to make. And uh, uh, I'm going to just show you uh, the example that uh, we have of this book. So. Eduardo Chiita had the, the brilliant idea, if we're really talking about shadows, let's print without ink. Can you see the, the way the shadows? Uh, so it comes in, a, comes in a box, which is part of that tradition too. Now this is the way books, of course, books originally were handmade, right? They were made they were on papyrus or on vellum. Um, and they were all made by hand. But the mechanical process obviously was terrific because it did exactly what Eduardo wanted to do with a public sculpture. It made book works public. Uh, but then it got out of hand, like a lot of technology. And by the time this tradition was resurrected by the French in the late 19th century, uh, the paper was garbage. And uh, it, it, they just don't last. So you don't find good books from about uh, 1860 to 1900. They're, they're just, they have to be very daintily cared for because they're, they're decomposing on their own. So uh, this is called the chemise. This is a tradition of the French. And this is all a very thick handmade paper, which then holds together the book. And then this is the title page, which you see here. Shadow belongs to light. I don't know if we have another other pages or not. And uh, these, these, are, these are folios of handmade paper, uh, uh, also from the Basque region. And uh, then we printed, uh, we printed the images, the, the text in a, a, in a graphite, just so that they would still be mostly realized through shadow. And there is the first trying to get the shadows. It, it, uh, in daylight, you can, uh, it just is brilliant uh, the way the, the shadows create the image. And, uh, and just to give you an idea of, of why uh, Eduardo Chida liked the text so much, uh, it starts out light. How could I do better than to accept the whiteness of the paper itself? And then in pairing, you'll see that there's a, a careful correlation of the line of type and, and the structure of the image. Uh, the first line on paper is already a measure of what cannot be fully expressed. So it then continues. There are uh, uh, seven uh, engravings that have been pressed against the paper and will perpetually uh, the paper is really transformed. If we mojado, no fue mojado, no. But the uh, pressure does transform, uh, uh, transform the paper so that even if it's soaked, it has a memory of, of this form. That was what originally frightened me about uh, uh, his dad's idea. <laughs> he said, no ink. I said, wait a minute. Uh, <laughs> um, 
So uh, I, I want to throw this open to questions now on the general topic, but I first wanted to uh, ask uh, uh, Eduardo T Ignacio to explain a bit uh, about what it's like to, uh, to have the role that he's had. Uh, uh, como es uh, estar así, uh, el, uh, para proteger la herencia de su papá, para estar gerente de una fundación, también uh, 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 trabajar con tus manos así. Uh, ¿cómo, uh, ¿Cómo lo sientes? <risa> Algo que, bueno, yo en toda mi vida, como he comentado antes, primero entré como grabador, hice su obra gráfica durante 25 años, prácticamente bastante más de la mitad de lo que hizo. Solo tuvo dos grabadores en su vida, uno fue el de Mark, eh, que se llamaba Robert Dittrup, con el cual yo aprendí y luego fui yo hasta que murió. Hice pues muchas cosas, muchísimas, de las cuales me, me siento muy, muy orgulloso. Y luego, pues cuando acabó eso, cuando él murió, dejé de trabajar la gráfica y me entré de director artístico y comisario de exposiciones y tal, pero no dejé de trabajar con mi padre y para mi padre y para mi familia también, pero principalmente para mi padre, que es mi deber. Y bueno, pues yo estoy muy contento, <ríe> o sea que tan solo espero que dé la talla, porque él era un hombre muy importante. So, uh, he, he worked for 25 years printing for his father, and his father only worked with two different printers. The other was Robert Dutroux, that was the printer that worked with Max um, was a great printer also. And um, when his father died, uh, he, he started to work like uh, organizing exhibitions and artistic director of the foundation uh, and uh, this kind of work like we're, we're doing now. But he, but he never stopped working and he never stopped working for his father. And that was his duty. That's his feeling is that was his duty, but also he feels his father was very important and that uh, he principally works for his father and also for his family, but more for his father. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, may we open it to questions? I now? think so, yeah. yes. I think, I think um, we, that would be perfect. Um, you had mentioned the gallery, I, I, I didn't hear the pronunciation, Gallery Maj. Mecht, Mecht or... Uh, yeah, it's pronounced in a thousand different ways. And it's M-A-E-G-H-T. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. It's sometimes Meg, it's sometimes Mecht, Macht. Oh, okay. Everybody says it differently. It, it, what is the origin of the I, name? It might be Dutch, yeah. yeah. It's a Dutch name. Yeah. Thank you. Is there, are there any I'm Pronounced Holland in French. <laughs> yeah, probably with a French twist. Yeah. Here we go. It was one of the most important galleries in, in Europe, uh, and, and still exists, no? Uh, but this... Just to follow up, it, it's a foundation now, uh, near uh, St. Paul de Vence. Yes. And um, it's, it's wonderful. So I wanted to, I've never seen it like that, so I just... I'm gonna well, the, it was a commercial gallery. Yes. And, and yeah. then, you know, later on they made a foundation. The foundation was made in 64, uh, and, um, and uh, Eduardo was there, you were there too. In 1964, and, and all, a lot of the artists were there, um, and it's it is wonderful. But uh, the gallery was the sort of the sort of commercial activity that made that foundation possible. Um, and the gallery started, I think, in 1940, right after the war, 46 or 47. And the partner Daniel Lelong, who split off, is is still his gallery is still influential. It has there's one in Paris. Uh, there's a New York version as well. So, uh, la galería Mike, lo que sí habría que decir es que era una galería eh, realmente muy especial porque acogía a sus artistas de una manera que eran casi como familia. 
De hecho, en Menmaek y Gigit, su mujer, a mi padre le llamaba Mon Garçon, o sea, como si fuera <risa> su hijo, porque era el más joven de los artistas de, de la galería. Y además coincidió que el hijo de May Gigit, que se llamaba... Eh, Adrian. No, no el, 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 el otro. El otro, eh, su hermano, murió muy joven. Y bueno, de alguna manera casi, casi a mi padre lo tenía como un cariño especial. So he's, he's really explaining why his father didn't, uh, the, the story behind this is why his father didn't go with another gallery is because the Mech Gallery was a totally uh, unique kind of uh, environment. It was like a, f a familial situation and and the, the gallerist uh, called his father uh, my, my boy. And, Uh, that kind of environment where th they were totally supportive of their artists, you know, um, in a way that uh, doesn't exist now. And, 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 you know, one thing that's really significant is that they, um, part of that support was um, uh, Aime Mike would, um, if the artist wanted to make a, a print or wanted to make a book or wanted to make sculpture, He said, fine, you want to make sculpture? I, I will, I'll pay for everything. Ponía todas las facilidades a los artistas para que pudieran desarrollar cualquier proyecto que, que quisieran, pero en un ambiente familiar. De hecho, mi padre y yo creo que todos los artistas de Mike en aquel momento no tenían ninguno contrato. Not, no so it was like a familiar relation. There were no contracts or anything, uh, and he would do things like he would set up his own like print shop, and, and any of the artists could could do prints in the in the shop. Or it was amazing. It was yeah. quite something. Probably Giacometti would never have cast in bronze without Mech. <laughs> yes. Um, Hi. One to kind of tie it in with Dali. One similarity I see is. Dali's uh, fascination with hard and soft and melting objects that should be rigid, and I see that a lot through Gita's work. Um, it's almost like a, a melting of the material and or a slumping um, beyond just what a, a sculptor does with the material and, and the, 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 the um, characteristics of the material, was there anything more possibly psychological um, in that? I think there's a kind of interest in the process of transformation uh, so that, you know, uh, it, you know, it's not like the inert material, it's like a kind of transformation that allows this sort of sense of poetry. Uh, la pregunta es, en Dali hay el, el blando y el duro y, y que igualmente hay formas rectas y formas curvilinear en Chile y si hay alguna relación a un nivel psicológico en alguna manera. Supongo que sí, pero yo creo que cuando hablas de artistas, eh, una de las condiciones indispensables, creo yo, para cualquier artista, y más en el caso de un escultor, como es en el caso de mi padre, era el respeto absoluto por los materiales. Eh, eso también lo es en un pintor, seguramente, ¿no? Pero desde luego en un escultor y en mi padre era absolutamente fundamental. Él jamás quiso doblegar al material ni luchar contra el material, sino ponerse de acuerdo con ellos. For a sculptor, uh, it's of course maybe it's true for painters, but for a sculptor, the respect of the materials is important. The one thing he wanted to say is that uh, the cheetah's point of view in relation to the material is not like a, a, a fight against the material, it's a kind of respect for the material. And um, I suppose other artists might talk about fighting the materials, uh, but th this is not the case in, with Cheetah. The baselets. Baselets, hacking the wood <laughs> with the axe. Uh, yeah, that's true. Aparentemente es así, pero realmente es de una delicadeza excepcional. It's really, everything is very delicate, and, and uh, even though it looks like in the forge and all that, it's a kind of Promethean and attack. 
against the material. Please. If, if we could ask Eduardo what was his gift, what do you think he would say? Yeah, his gift in terms of talent or yeah. what, what he gave the world? What, what he gave the world. What he gave the world. Yeah. Um, ¿Qué regalo ha hecho al mundo uh, Eduardo? El mayor que podía hacer, porque se dedicó en cuerpo y alma y realmente toda la obra que hizo Chillida está relacionada con, con las personas. Eh, cuando se ven esas enormes esculturas, eh, él realmente las hacía todas, da igual la dimensión de la propia escultura, pero en él eh, la escala que queda prioritaria era la escala del ser humano, de las personas a las que él quería llegar. Y da igual que fuera una escultura así de pequeñita, como una escultura como hemos visto de 12 metros de alto, eh, está presente en la misma escala, la escala humana. La única relación que uno tiene que hacer un esfuerzo es cuando ve una pequeña lograr reducirse él para llegar a, a esa escala. Y es cosa muy sencilla, además, porque veréis cuando veáis la exposición que tú penetras en el interior de las esculturas como si fueran de 30 metros de alto. Exactamente igual, no hay más que hacer un pequeño esfuerzo porque todas están hechas con ese mismo it's uh, the sort of human dimension and the, uh, more, more importantly the human scale uh, and that this is a quality of the little pieces or the very, very big public pieces and even the small ones uh, that he would imagine uh, how you can relate to it on a, on a, on, in terms of this human scale so that even if it's a small thing you, uh, you could imagine the idea of going inside of it. So it's this idea of the of retaining the, the humanity and the human scale that would be the gift. Realmente, Chiida fue un humanista, o sea, clarísimamente una persona que se dedicó en cuerpo y alma a ello. Y bueno, pues creo que lo hizo so razonable. She, she was really a, a, a kind of humanist and who put uh, his soul into the, into the work that he, uh, that he achieved and that it's this kind of humanist dimension. Great. Great. Yes? I'm interested in uh, wondering about the play between gravity and almost a defiance of gravity, working with such heavy materials, and you have some of those pieces that don't appear that way. And the second part would be, is there any influence from Dalí? From? Dalí. Um, Tiene dos, dos preguntas. La primera, tú entiendes del, del peso y el, y el, y el ligero, sí. la, la, la tensión entre el peso y el ligero. La otra es si había alguna conexión con, con el arquitecto Gaudí. Sí, eh, hombre, eh, él tenía una, una gran admiración por, por la obra de Gaudí. Eh, no eran gente muy distinta, yo creo que tenían muchísimas cosas en común. De hecho, hace poco me ofrecieron la posibilidad de hacer una exposición, en, ya hizo una en La Pedrera, pero también en la casa, ¿cómo se llama la de Barcelona? La casa eh, en el, la que visita a todo el mundo. A este caso en el mismo calle. Sí, sí. Y, pero al final no la pues hicimos, claro. pero, pero claro que tiene muchísima relación. Y en cuanto a lo que pregunta este señor de la, de la gravitación y de todas esas cuestiones del peso y demás, eh, son absolutamente fundamentales en la obra de Eduardo Chillida. Él nunca quería hacer cosas grandes como hay, pues por ejemplo, hoy en día que ves a muchos arquitectos que parece que están luchando por hacer un edificio que si uno es así, el otro lo hace así, para que sea un poco más alto, ¿no? Uh -huh. A él eso no le interesaba en absoluto. La medida de las cosas lo daba el entorno, uh -huh. la naturaleza, la arquitectura, el urbanismo, y era necesario que fueran de una dimensión u otra, siempre en relación al ser humano. Y, y eso pues le llevaba a proyectos de, francamente de locos, porque eran terriblemente complejos pero él nunca eludió las, eh, 
las dificultades. So in the, the first part of your question about weight and uh, he, um, he never wanted to uh, just make something big to make it big uh, or to, you know, like architects, uh, my skyscraper is taller than your skyscraper. <laughs> it was all about the human scale, so even if it was a large outdoor piece, it was because of the context that the scale was like that and, it, and its relation to the, to the human body and the human proportion. Um, so the context determined the size, whether the thing is that big or whether it's enormous. So that, that's an important uh, element in this kind of tension between the weight and the lightness or transparency of the pieces. And that there is, yes, there is a kind of uh, a relation to, um, to Gaudi and interest. And there had, there's been one, one exhibit in, the, in La Pedrera um, of Cheetah's work, which is a, one of the Gaudi buildings, and apparently there may be another one in, in, in the other, um, uh, I don't remember the name of it, but the other, the other Gaudi building that's in the same street, just uh, three or four blocks away, in Paseo de Gracia in Barcelona. Um, and that, there, that he admired um, Gaudi very much, and that there, there, there is a s certain commonality there. I think we can take one more question. Yes, sir. Do you think it put Dean Whitman on into training with the architect? Do you still think it would have entered into the art world? Um, si ha continuado su formación de arquitecto, ¿a ti te crees que igualmente ha, ha llegado a ser artista? Él, mm, yo creo que las obras de Chihida son en una enorme medida mm, proyectos o cosas que son arquitectura pura, vamos, hay, hay muchísimas de ellas que son realmente impresionantes en la relación que tiene con, con la arquitectura, ¿no? Pero toda su obra está impregnada de, de la arquitectura y del humanismo, como hemos hablado, y de otras muchas cuestiones que la hacen, yo creo, pues un artista muy, por lo menos muy serio, muy, muy serio, y que se tomó la vida como una, como si fuera algo que él había llegado aquí para hacer algo, no solo para él, sino para, para los demás. Well, the, uh, uh, he's saying that the, many of the sculptures are almost like architecture and that there's a very strong architectonic quality running throughout the, the sculpture, um, that he approached, uh, his work in a very serious way and with the idea uh, that there was a sort of purpose that he had to fulfill in his life um, and always with this sense of the human scale that he commented on earlier. And, and my sense from knowing him just a little is that uh, his ambition was, his ambition, his, his, his mission in life was to do things of, of too much of a singular vision, his own vision, uh, to bear the kinds of compromises that you have to do, make when you're making public spaces. Um, you know, we, we need more volume for the air conditioning. Can you get rid of that side of the building? You know, I don't think he would have tolerated that. <laughs> So uh, it, I'm sure uh, Ignacio would entertain more questions privately uh, if you want to stay, but thank you for being such a great audience, and thank Ignacio and William. <laughs>